Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we're going to begin topic two and talking about innovation and boosting growth through innovation. It's the beginning of industrialism. Uh, we'll talk about the factors that encouraged industrialism. We will talk about new inventions and scientific discoveries, uh, why the same thing couldn't be said by the South, and the impact overall of industrialization. So there's five factors that encourage the growth of industrialization. One is this happens on the heels of the Civil War, where pretty much after every war, we get new technologies and uh, innovations and manufacturing methods because they force sides to compete against one another to make things more quickly and efficiently. Uh, new tools and methods after the, are, that were discovered during the Civil War are then used to manufacture goods. Secondly, we have an entire half of our country that has yet to be uh, basically used uh, with natural resources. Think of all the natural resources out west. I mean, even in the east, we have coal mines along the eastern seaboard. We have forests, abundant forests. In 1859, we discover how to drill for oil in Titusville, Pennsylvania. You can see the first oil well in that picture. And then we'll talk about this later, but we take iron ore that is... Uh, mined and make it into high strength steel through the Bessemer process and that helps even more um, even more inventions to be created. Also this is the time of heavy immigration to the United States. Uh, Europeans and Asians migrate to the US, uh, Asians to the West Coast, Europeans to the East Coast. We almost get 1 million per year by 1905. These immigrants are willing to work for lower wages because it's still more than they would be making back home, and there's also high competition with other uh, workers. And to make it even more um, intense competition, farmers who are being put out of work by mechanized farms also begin moving to the cities to look for work. And we'll talk about urbanization in uh, a couple lessons from now. Technology and innovation. So people are finding better ways to do things. Entrepreneurs are people who invest their time and money into a product. And these people rely on the systems of capitalism and free enterprise. Whereas capitalism is where uh, an economic system where individuals own private businesses. And free enterprise is the uh, theory that those businesses should be minimally regulated by the government. It's called laissez-faire capitalism, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this competition with one another increases efficiency, cuts costs, and lowers prices. And most entrepreneurs are re trying to become a rags-to-riches story, like they read in Horatio Alger's um, book novels of the time about uh, becoming a rags-to-riches story. And then, like I said, laissez-faire means hands-off, and it allows businesses to operate free from most government regulations. So basically, the government isn't doing anything, or they're not doing much to stop this, and even, even they're encouraging it a little bit. And this leaves little protection for workers, which is why they'll have to unionize, and we'll talk about that in a few lessons. But combine these policies with a legal system that protects property rights, Businesses and industries flourish under this system. Congress even enacts protective tariffs, which is uh, taxes on an imported good. So if imports are more expensive, Americans will buy goods that were made here if they're of favorable uh, equal quality. And Congress also gives favorable contracts to businesses willing to develop the West, especially the railroad businesses. And eventually we will have three transcontinental railroads. So just to review, we have the Civil War, natural resources, a growing labor supply, technology and innovation, and government policies all help to spur industrialization. Inventions galore, uh, a patent on an invention is something that the federal government gives and it grants an inventor the right to develop, use, and sell their invention for a set period of time so that no one else can steal their idea because if someone else can make money off of your idea, why would you go through the trouble to invent it? So each patent has to have an application with a drawing. Here is a patent for it looks like a Big Mac or maybe a Whopper, but I'm saying a Big Mac uh, just for an example. 
Thomas Edison, not the creator of the Big Mac, received more than 1,000 patents for his invention, and one of his most famous is the light bulb. Electricity during this time helps improve American standard of living and even extend the number of hours that Americans can work and play every day. Because before electricity, you're pretty much stuck when the sun goes down. I mean, we have candles that we can kind of light our way with, but it's nothing like an electric light. Thomas Edison was a proponent of direct current, and he actually patents the incandescent light bulb and starts the General Electric Company. Or, you know, th that's putting it very, very generally, but he is part of the General Electric Company, which is still around today. And here you can see his patent for the incandescent light bulb. George Westinghouse, his rival, figures out how to send electricity over long distances by using Nikola Tesla's alternating current system. And there's the current wars trying to figure out which one is going to be widely used. And they end up going with alternating current because it can be sent over long distances. So this begins to power homes and factories from one central location where with direct current, you would need multiple um, short range power plants all over the place to uh, power these homes. More improvements. We have improvements in communications with the telegraph perfected by Samuel Morse in 1844, and that's Morse code. You can see the beeps and um, dots there on the chart on the right. And Marconi actually invents the wireless telegraph, and people use that technology to invent the radio later on. But we have the wireless telegraph, the regular telegraph. Uh, we have the telephone invented a couple decades after the telegraph. And that is invented by Alexander Graham Bell, which you can see here uh, demonstrating the first telephone. Doesn't look like, much like a phone. Within a few years, um, we'd have 34,000 miles of telephone wire laid. And in 1900, we would have about 1 million telephones in the United States. Uh, the birth of modern telecommunications. Here you can see the time that it would take to do regular mail, to mail a letter, the Pony Express, a telegraph message, and today you could do a text message in just a few seconds. So very, very important stuff. Uh, the Bessemer process actually is a way of melting off all the, burning off all the impurities from iron ore. And this high strength steel can be used to make taller buildings like skyscrapers and suspension bridges, which is a roadway uh, suspended by steel cables. But more than any other factor, the growth of the U.S. can be linked to railroads. We can transport large amounts of goods uh, quickly, cheaply and efficiently. Cities are created along these railroads and it greatly influences the physical and economic growth of other cities. Chicago, since it's right in the middle and it's on water as well, becomes the nation's railroad hub. Manufactured goods usually come from the east and livestock and grain come from the west and they go to Chicago and then are sent out all over the place. With railroads being able to get to place to place fairly quickly, uh, scheduling became a problem so delegates from 27 countries got together during this time and developed the time zones that we know and the globe is divided into 24 time zones to help scheduling other inventions we get better railroad cars with automatic couplers air brakes refrigerator cars dining cars heated cars sleeping cars lavish Depots devoted to trains are built like Grand Central Station in New York, Union Depot in Chicago. Fort Wayne is actually a major rail hub between Chicago and Pittsburgh. Uh, electric streetcars, commuter trains, and subways are different ways to get around in the city. This means that Americans can start to live outside of the city and transport or commute into the city to work. Automobiles begin to be mass produced in 1902. And mass production is a process invented during this time to uh, use machinery to replace human parts. And that way we can turn out large numbers of products quickly and inexpensively. New industries in the South. Keep in mind, the thing that holds back the South is they have to rebuild from the Civil War to begin with. So before we just shipped from the South cotton, wood, and iron ore, now Northern investors back different companies such as textiles, cigar, lumber production, coal production, 
iron and steel processing plants are all made in the south and farming also diversifies with more grain uh, tobacco and fruit rather than just cotton rail lines expand in the south you can see here the rail lines in uh, 1830 50 1850 and then the railroads in 1870 are the green so we expand railroads a lot this joins rural areas with urban hubs in order to get products to where they need to go economic recovery is limited in the, in the south because of the civil war they don't have enough capital investment or labor in the south a lot of people moved away they don't have a lot of education and training because they lack the agricultural and technical schools or a n t schools that are needed to train workers and also lower wages discouraged anybody from coming to the south so this all slowed the industrialization in the south farmers if they are absolutely dependent uh, or insistent they burned or I'm sorry grew cash crops and cash crops are crops that are just grown for money and so cotton is a cash crop you can't eat cotton it can't do anything for you but you can sell it to somebody who can make clothes people still wanted to grow cotton despite its decreasing price Europeans found other buyers during the Civil War and prices drop at that point and also we have some vicious bull weevil infestations that destroy the cotton crops so people who stayed with cotton crops had a pretty or I'm sorry cotton crops which are cash, cash crops have a pretty rough time so what are the effects of all this industrialization? Uh, the U.S. becomes a leading exporter due to the railroads making it easy to ship goods to the coast to be uh, shipped out to other countries. Uh, that makes us a world economic power during this time. Uh, it changes our domestic way of life because farms become more mechanized. And like I said before, those out of work farmers come to the city where they have easy access to different jobs and goods and environmental concerns people start re realizing you know we can't keep destroying the environment like this so the national government eventually starts setting aside land that will eventually become our national parks system uh, which has just recently celebrated its uh, 100th birthday so the yellowstone national park is one of the first ones in the entire world in 1872 and that is all i have for you today fill out those learning targets and i will talk to you later Bye bye